He sanded the wood blue a little on the surface and looked thoughtfully at the twisting path of darkness on the dark wood of the keel. Definitely a crack. But there remained the question of nature or nurture. If the crack was on the surface, he could fill it with epoxy and sand it down. If the crack went all the way through the board, however, then the wood was just bad and he would have to rebuild the boat to replace the doomed piece. Richard Thomas glanced back at the warm, oily glow of the lights of the house a hundred yards away. As darkness fell in the air, putting aside everything he could, he made his way back to his bleak household. Things were once more promising. He married Karen Johnson, his high school sweetheart, shortly after graduating from college. She wouldn't even talk to a guy like him from a single-parent family. But she met him at a mixer at their church that preached free markets and social justice. Be kind to children from single-parent families, says her father, a psychologist. They are more like feral animals because life has mistreated them. You can't expect them to care about helping others only themselves. Karen shunned most of them, but as she stared off into space, she happened to meet Richard's gaze. Hi, he said to her in passing. She saw a rather muscular boy with bright blue eyes and hair, the color of honey, quite handsome, and slightly above average height. He was one inch short of six feet. She knew he was a bit of a bully in class, but he also got pretty good grades and had made himself some kind of boat for which he'd gotten an award. He scared her because his father was an oil company executive, which her parents said were evil people and she knew Richard as a straightforward, outspoken guy who often left grudges behind. Hi there, she said with typical teenage irreverence. He saw a slender girl with an innocent face, unreadable gray eyes and bright blonde hair. She acted as elegant as a dancer and had muscles from playing field hockey. He knew she got high grades but acted quiet in class, as if she was waiting for some reason to come out of her shell an inch below his height. She seemed lively, but unwilling to open herself up to the world. Though he suspected that if she ever became confident enough to have her own opinions, she could understand a lot. They talked the rest of the night, touching on every possible random topic intertwined with predictable familiarity. Karen went home that evening in a state of deep confusion. Like most of her generation, Karen had no idea what love was, or how it related to attraction and lust. She got one idea from the classic books they read in school, another from Hollywood and popular music, and a third from church and her parents in the movies. A beautiful man and a beautiful woman would meet in some awkward situation, then start arguing, and what her psychologist aunt called codependent relationships, but end up in bed together and discover in the morning that they were in love. The books she was assigned in school praised men and women who escaped societal pressures to remain virtuous and then met their true love and companion in the midst of selfless labor. Her parents emphasized finding a man with a good career who wouldn't destroy the family but wouldn't treat her unequally either. She had never seen Richard as anything but one of the guys she would leave behind with the rest of the school. But she felt something that might have been a desire to make him like her, approve of her, even desire her. Karen and Richard had started dating in their last year of high school, that bittersweet time when people realize that approaching adulthood will shatter old friendships and loves. She knew Richard was afraid of her too. One day in history class, the teacher noticed that most of the students were catatonic or asleep and pounced on Richard with a question about Hitler and Stalin. Tyrants confuse what they are with what they could be, says Richard Stalin, a former bank robber, confused power with importance and turned his country into a bureaucratic dictatorship that killed 30 million people through sheer incompetence. Hitler, an artist, confused his popularity with moral rectitude and started a war that devastated his country. A good leader rules for the sake of his people, not for his own power or self-importance. The teacher furrowed his brow. Half the class shuddered. What about war crimes? genocide, and oppression. Richard grinned. History is written in blood, brutality, and extermination, because those are the only signals that awaken people. Otherwise, they just follow their own inertia. Hitler was like Robespierre, a true believer, who ended up executing anyone who disagreed with him because he needed to believe in the truth of his ideology. 
Stalin was more like Genghis Khan, a glorified criminal or third world warlord who knew his ideology was BS and as a result was able to survive mostly by sacrificing others. They are almost as bad as our current leaders who are doing the same thing to us, only slower. At that moment, Karen realized there was something about Richard that she couldn't tame. She liked domestic men like her father, who followed the rules when her mother had needs. He met them, and if he disagreed, he bit his lip and grudgingly complied. Her parents were equals and discussed every decision together. Compared to him, Richard was like some wild animal acting purely on instinct and heart, and she knew it was impossible to control. But at the same time, she knew in her gut that he was the only man she could truly love. You need to date other boys, her mother Beverly said. You can't be involved with only one man your whole life. It will always be an unequal relationship in which he will have the upper hand. He has to know that there are absolute rules that he can't break. Marriage is like a small social group where if you don't assert your authority, you will be forced to conform to what others want. And so Karen found her name on the rumor mill and she was dating other boys. She never went further than petting it made her moderately popular, and she graduated high school on a high note. If Richard ever noticed her skills improving, he never questioned why, or at least never said anything. Richard received a full scholarship to the same local university she attended, but Karen's mother decided to experience a wider range of sexual partners. No one was fooled by her work delays or bachelorette parties. The marriage disintegrated like a sparrow hit by a spaceship, scattering Karen and her brothers to different apartments on both ends of town with varying degrees of insufficient money. She finally understood what Richard had been through, except that his father was an executive of a major oil company, and they had more money than her parents, a school psychologist and a high school history teacher. She escaped the middle-class poverty and disorder in which she lived and married Richard. He got his first serious job, and they had children. Daniel when Richard was still working at the entry level, and Carl, Robert, and Suzanne after each of his promotions. Soon, they had a nice house in a decent suburb. Are you satisfied? asked Richard to Karen one evening. I think so, she said. I'm not sure that's the question. Are you happy? Happiness? he said. I don't believe in it. He was reading to her from a book. He'd been reading his old favorite, which she'd never liked. You're a bad driver. I protested. Either you should be more careful or not drive at all. I'm careful. No, it's not. Well, other people too, she said lightly. What's that got to do with it? They won't bother me, she insisted. It takes two to have an accident. Suppose you met someone as careless as yourself. I hope never, she replied. I hate frivolous people. That's why I like you. Each of us is responsible for our own happiness, Richard says. It's about being responsible to your true self. You have to make yourself good to please yourself. And only then can you appreciate what life is really about. She looked at the man as if she barely knew him. Looks joyless. Not at all. It's just a realistic way of looking at things, Richard said, smoking his pipe. What? You are. Your job and how others see you is not who you are. You choose who you become. Even love is a choice, as Siddhartha would say. External events neither please nor displease. But thoughts make them so. Time passed, and they both forgot that conversation as a faded story. By the time she was thirty, Karen was running a household that was old enough to take care of itself on its own. As parents find out, by the time children reach puberty, your window of opportunity to teach them something has passed. They enter adulthood, albeit early on, and make decisions on their own, based in part on what their parents have taught them. To the extent that they trust their parents, Richard had gone from a job where he showed up and did what others told him to do to a business, which meant that he spent most of his time thinking about how to get his company into a position where it had enough money to acquire a stable market niche in which it could expand. He now had three employees, two negotiators and an office manager. His office manager, Sue Scott, came to him straight out of graduate school. She had an MFA in creative writing, but found that the insular little community that endorsed the next big thing in literature had clear tastes, 
and she, who loved the classics and ancient texts, her undergraduate degree was in classics for their timeless themes, wasn't going to make it in the world of the latest ironic styles and personality quirks. What do you hope to accomplish here? Richard asked, without looking up Sue. She didn't like Susan's name, which she thought sounded like furniture. Looked at him with bright gray-blue eyes. Mr. Thomas, I like to be blunt, she said after a few minutes. I need a job I won't hate. My college education is worthless. So I'm starting over, and I want to learn practical business skills so I can open a cat rescue service someday, and not go bankrupt like most do within a few years. I'm here because out of all the places I called, the people here seemed genuine, and everyone was honest with me. Richard hesitated for a moment. You're hired, he said. What? She whispered and averted her eyes. No, it's not for your appearance. We're professionals here, and we don't do that because it might hurt the other person. I warn you, I'm not a sensitive person. I'm a caveman, but I like fair play. No, you took a big risk with that answer. You told the plain truth, and judging by your undergraduate and part-time work, you're very competent. So I'm betting on you. Although it was a rough start, having to learn a new language for business. She settled in quickly once she got the hang of it. Richard was not attracted to her at first, although she was an attractive girl from next door with a thin, graceful face and slender body. But as he began to rely on her daily, he saw that she was intelligent and diligent. However, he was committed to his marriage, his business, and his notion of fair play, which meant he didn't want to cross that line, especially with someone who was a few years younger than him and financially vulnerable. What she asked him once, I beg your pardon, he said. You looked at me like you wanted to say something, she said, ignoring her boss's deep, smoky gaze, which he momentarily forgot to hide. Just pondering a meeting with a client, he brushed it off. That turned out to be fortunate, because later that week, she showed up with her boyfriend, Alex. He was a dancer, muscular as a boa constrictor, and agile enough to balance on one leg, on the railing above their two-story conference room. Richard returned home and took a cold shower, realizing for the first time the pain of temptation and the satisfaction of giving it up. He had passed the test, and one life went on, and soon he was once again absorbed in building his company. Making his first attempt to repair the old sailboat left to him by his grandfather and caring for his children, he quickly forgot about Sue, except as a co-worker, and was grateful for that with more free time. Karen got a job at the advertising firm where her uncle worked. The kids were already busy as adults' sports, rock bands, art classes, ballet debate, and martial arts after school, and then sitting on their phones or doing homework until midnight. She started working as an administrative assistant in her second week on the job. The manager above her quit, and before she knew it, Karen had taken the position. It required her to spend at least ten hours a day in the office. But by getting up early, she made it. And her husband, who came home early, could cook dinner for the kids. She shared her fears with her mother, Beverly. I feel like I'm turning into two people. One is home where there's no glory, just more socks to wash. The other is my career where I'm rising fast. And now I want to move to the city. It's a necessary part of growing up. Her mother said you overcame the inequalities of being a woman, gave up being defined by who you are and the role society has defined for you. And now who you are matters. You are part of this economy and culture, and now you matter even more than the loser you married. He's not a loser. Karen said he came back, got his JD, an MBA, and now runs a negotiation firm. We live very comfortably. Yes, but who will remember him when he dies? Her mother said. He's just another empty face in a suit and tie. You, on the other hand, are breaking boundaries by engaging in a cause that is both progressive and will soon yield huge profits. Your life becomes meaningful because of what you are and what you do. Beverly was still working at the same job in the school district where she met the man who was to become her second husband. However, it turned out that his wife was willing to forgive his misdeeds, so he came back to her and did not run off with Bev as they had planned. She ended up living alone, but led an active social life and was recognized in several local magazines for her work in fostering Christian compassion for the underprivileged. When Karen took the casserole to her father, 
who lived in an apartment he could afford after paying child support and alimony, he wearily said, Don't let jobs become your soul. They're not worth it. You are who you are, with or without a job, and a family is just a bonus. You will always be my smart, loving, kind girl. Take this from me. I've given too many years to work, church, and politics. I'd rather spend that time making more connections with people. If you want to be famous, write a book or something. Now Karen was wandering in doubt through the catacombs of her mind. She'd never been one of those kids everyone knows and talks about just a goofball, albeit an excellent student and highly respected. Although Richard made good money and was a loving father, he wasn't like the men she'd read about in the news who invented new social networks, made rocket ships, or ran non-profit organizations that gave microloans to the hungry in third-world countries. Karen was promoted again when the company fragmented due to a possible merger. Half the employees left the company out of disgust at being swallowed up by a competitor. But for Karen, the move was brilliant because it more than doubled their market share. She took over the positions vacated by the defectors when she presented her ideas to her boss, Jeb Sheehan. He visibly brightened at the potential benefits of her new marketing direction, which combined sound capitalist wisdom with human rights activism and insisted that she work with him directly. She soon found herself spending more and more time in the office. Her family, like all organic beings, adapted. Daniel began to cook more, as did Richard. The younger ones helped wash vegetables and clean the house. They were all proud of her, she thought. Though she sensed some hesitation on the part of her spouse during this time, she grew close to Jeb, and they eventually developed a close working relationship as they reorganized the bloated company into a tight fighting team aimed at dominating the market. Her friends barely recognized her. Karen had updated her closet and worked out for an hour every morning in her home elliptical gym. She knew she looked like $1,000 $1,000 because heads turned when she walked into a room. The former high school girl not only broke through the glass ceiling and suppressed inequality, but she became desirable because of her mind, body, and personality. Her family took a back seat to her biography. Richard had observed this from the sidelines, having seen it many times in his day job. After all, his mother had left to become an executive vice president in Bangkok but he'd never mentioned it to Karen. What was it? First, a nagging pain in his gut turned into heaviness, then emptiness, and finally, a cramp. He began to notice that sometimes he was short of breath, as if he had forgotten to breathe, and that he often felt cramps in his bowels. You know, Richard said one day, as they were cutting string beans for Saturday night dinner, I always try to apply the wife test at work. If I'm doing something and you walk in and get upset about what I'm doing, I'd rather not do it. That even applies to being behind closed doors alone with a female co-worker. Honey, I don't care, Karen said absent-mindedly. And in that moment, Richard saw her outlook change. There was no jealousy, which meant she already cared enough about him to possess him to the exclusion of everyone else. Richard knew that for love to exist, it had to be jealous. Otherwise, it was just using another person for convenience. That's a good rule, he said. I mean, if you want your spouse to be happy, are you happy? Karen? Karen said nothing. They fed the kids, watched a terrible action movie that had everyone enthralled by its crude action, and then went to bed. Richard leaned on Karen's spoon and tried to draw her to him, but she pulled away. Not now, she said in the same voice. She'd used to speak to a subordinate, she rolled over onto her back, and by the light of a small book, Lantern began to look through a folder of documents related to the upcoming merger at her company. Richard drifted into a troubled sleep. He knew from his science lessons that when a female rejects a male, it means she considers the other male to be superior and will never go back to the old one unless her gambit fails. Raised on the idea that love involves rejection of all others rather than a constant search for new opportunities, he found her answer troubling. He drifted into a troubled sleep, plagued by dark thoughts and images. When Karen got up, he was nowhere to be found, but he soon came running up the driveway. Over the next few weeks, Richard ran five miles a day, worked out at the home gym in the garage, and updated his old slouchy closet. Saturday night, the babysitter showed up, 
and he took Karen to her favorite Italian restaurant. A movie and an elegant new club for outsiders to drink and dance. She danced with him twice, then checked her phone and told him they had to go home. He was afraid of what he had seen so many times before. People mistook signal for action, map for territory, appearance for reality, gesture for meaning, and what they were for, what they were. The grass is always greener, he thought, because you knew the disadvantages of your current situation, but saw only the advantages of moving to another. In his experience, things started out well in the new grass, but then ended disastrously. He doubled his courtship. He showed up at her workplace with flowers, and saw her secretary roll her eyes. He wondered what she had been told about him. He called her twice a day non-stop and repeated his Saturday night escapades. After losing PS5, he increased his workouts and soon noticed that his muscle definition had improved. He bought her a necklace she had noticed in the window of a jewelry store. He felt the mistake coming like a distant storm, but was powerless to stop it. In each case, she expressed her gratitude, stayed around for the minimum amount of time necessary to be polite, and then left to do some errands in preparation for the next workday. You've been pretty aloof lately he told her one evening. What can I do to keep our marriage afloat? He looked at her with empty eyes. He knew there were two options here. She recognized the problem. They worked on it, and life moved forward because they were in unison. That meant she still believed in him, respected him, and was on his team working toward their common interests. She denied the problem because she either didn't think it could be solved or wasn't interested in it. This meant that in her heart and mind, she had already abandoned the marriage and viewed it as irrelevant. What do you mean? Karen blurted out. We don't date anymore. We hardly ever make love. And when we do, it looks like you're waiting for a cab. We rarely talk, since you took this job. I haven't seen you smile at me uninvited or spend time with me unless I demand it, Richard said. He knew where this was going. And to his surprise, it didn't make him angry in the slightest. It made him sick hurt, and restless. He saw everything he wanted, slipping away like a candle, melting and pouring down the drain. Karen looked directly at him. For him, it was a crisis. For her, it was a delicate situation that needed to be put off the way one puts off a vendor who wants to get paid at his job. She thought about eventually going back to the marriage she now thought she was happy with. She had better opportunities now, and marriage was her backup plan for when she was done enjoying all that life had to offer her. I haven't noticed any problems, she replied lightly. That night they went to bed in different worlds. They might as well have been in different dimensions on distant planets or belonged to different species. All they had in common. Richard wondered where he had gone wrong, then realized that Karen had always led a crusade in which the oppressed confronted the powerful. Being a good husband and provider made him the powerful entity she rebelled against and enjoyed defeating. He talked to his longtime friend, Sheriff Danville Harris, who counseled his father during the divorce. She's dancing with the devil, said the sheriff. I never got into religion other than the general belief that some benevolent force created this place and is taking care of us since we're basically suicidal goons. He grinned. I always thought the Old Testament God must have drunk a huge bottle of Advil watching his people go out into the streets and do nothing but screw up all the time because their egos get in the way. In the police academy, we were taught a little bit about Jung and Freud and the ego and the ID. It basically looks like this. The sheriff lit one of his favorite Italian cigars, cutting it in half with a penknife through the bulge in the middle. The ID makes decisions. It's basically who we are in our insides and souls. The ego explains what happens in response to our decisions, so that we look good to ourselves and others. And that's what we think of as what we are. The ID is a multitude of conflicting impulses, and the one that is least destructive and most beneficial wins at least in theory. He lit a cigarette and continued. We were told at the academy that you have to explain things to the ego, so the ID will choose the path of least resistance to make it impossible to fight or flee. Offer some food. And most of the time, you can get them into the system without violence. With your wife, it's the other way around. 
Her ego makes the decisions, forcing the ID down that path, so she loses a sense of who she is. I guess the question for you, the sheriff said, taking a slight drag to light, is fading. Cigar again is whether you want to make things right. After all, she has, as they say, showing you her butt. It's not just a superficial flaw, but something that went wrong deep inside her. Life is just a ladder when you're going where you need to go. It's a hard way up. When you go somewhere wrong, it's a hop and a skip downward. She went down the stairs to the bottom and can't find the stairs to the top. Do you think she cheated on you? No, Richard said. Not yet. Physically. But in her mind, she is ready. And now that I know it, I will never be able to enjoy her again. My faith in her is shattered, as is my respect. After she herself rejected me, she simply threw away my love, trust, affection, and hope. That's undoubtedly true, said the sheriff, by choosing another man. You're telling the first man that he's not good enough for you. And that leads to only two choices. Either you accept him back, but resent him, or you reject him. So you don't resent yourself for agreeing. In my experience, once they make a decision, they may not be out the door right away yet, but they're already headed that way. Richard replied grimly. Well, thanks, Sheriff. I'll figure something out. The next time he saw Karen on an evening when she wasn't working late, he gently suggested that they spend more time together to save the marriage. He then tried to invite her to ballroom dancing lessons, but she declined, citing her workload. He spent hours on foot massages, conversation, and wine of the finest variety, to no avail. In each case, he felt her contempt. I realized how insignificant he was in her eyes, and felt a few more tons of grim hopelessness and gray misery add to his gut. Finally, he simply asked, Do you want a divorce? Richard asked. What? Karen said. Why do you ask that? I'd like an answer first, yes or no. Karen went back to reading. No, I don't think so. Why? Well, that would be inconsiderate, wouldn't it? We have children. We have a house, we both have careers, and we benefit from having spouses. I, I, Richard said, slowly, stretching the syllable. And I love you, Karen said, lowering her eyes to the floor. We'll grow old together. We'll have grandchildren. We'll be able to buy that house on the lake we've always talked about and spend our golden years there. Richard looked at her, his eyes clear. She couldn't see the tragedy in them when they loved each other. She would have told him he was a big, stupid idiot and smothered him with kisses. Now she treated him like a subordinate at work or maybe an uncooperative supplier and basically silenced him. What about meeting him halfway, supporting him, and making him feel love? No, that was as dead as their love life. Fourteen-year-old Robert gave him the next piece of the puzzle for all of life as a puzzle. And the first step in solving a puzzle is to identify all of its pieces— Remember that girl I was going to go to the fall dance with? She left me to go camping with Owen Rogers and his weird family. The one you gave the necklace to? Richard asked. Yeah, just a week ago, Robert said. You know, alpha males and beta males. Girls want a stable guy to provide money and a stud for love. He blushed slightly at those words. You're a nerd, but you're also a stud, Richard said, stroking his hair. True. It'll take a few years, but someday... Some girl will realize you're attractive. Do you want to come to the gym with me? We can tighten you up a bit. Yes, Robert said. That would be great. I saw that you've built up some muscle, too. Four miles away, at an embarrassingly close distance, separated by social conventions, that men don't just show up at their wives. Place of work. Jeb was having a similar conversation with Karen. He's a good guy, a good reliable husband, Jeb said. But you and I are doing something big. This will be the first advertising firm in history to combine good deeds and big profits. We're going to make history, so I need you all in, if you know what I mean. Karen lifted her head, her eyes dryly focused. They both knew what he was talking about. Back at the house, Richard fed the children read to Suzanne, helped Kaya with geometry, and called Daniel, who was attending a state university on a full scholarship. He decided not to waste any more time with his wife and to enjoy the children more. When Karen came home and went straight to the shower, bringing her phone with her, he shuddered in bed, 
His gut began to twist painfully, and cold sweat broke out over his eyes. He hardly slept that night, though. Karen snored softly like a purring cat. When he looked in the mirror in the morning, he saw how dead still his eyes sat and unlit, their usual bright blue color reduced to a dimensionless cobalt. He didn't recognize the expression at first, but then he remembered it from his high school volunteer project at the Veterans Hospital, where he'd met people who'd seen too much of war. It was the eyes of a man trying to contain his agony, unsure if at any moment the devil might spill out from within and leave a bloody wasteland in his wake. Everything okay? Sue asked him mid-morning. They were struggling with a new contract that was going to crunch their schedule and possibly make a loss. Didn't get enough sleep, he said. That's about it. I'll have some more coffee and gather my thoughts. She looked at him with concern. I'll get the coffee. Don't get used to it. He ended up smiling in spite of himself, and by the end of the day, he had set everything up, negotiated additional fees, and set up a six-month schedule that could be coordinated with existing clients. He said his goodbyes and drove home, letting his mind unfocused and relax as he had long ago learned in Vipassana training. And then it hit him. Marriage was a love partnership, a family and a business. He needed to solve the problem in a business way, and then use business logic to fix it. Over the past few days, he had done a little research on cheating spouses. Most of them appeared to be just bored and feeling insignificant. It usually happened at work, which replaced the sense of well-being given by family. When self-pity and lust coincided, the desire became strong. Most affairs went unnoticed, though in his experience, that usually meant the marriage was a zombie a once-living creature now dead but reanimated without a soul. Few of them lasted long, though, as he'd observed if someone cheated once, they were more likely to do it again. He also read stories on internet sites telling of similar tragedies. They seemed unbelievable to him. He could not imagine any desire to harm his wife, nor could he imagine any rage. Instead, he felt pain. Deep pain reverberated through his body, throbbing in his eyes and fingertips with every breath. It was simply a tragedy, an unsolvable tragedy. Stories of reconciliation seemed unrealistic and overly emotional to him. What had been was broken and could not be rebuilt. Daddy Kaya greeted him at the door. He looked up and saw his children's three pairs of eyes, watching him intently. They knew, he realized. They always know, he thought remembering how he had felt, the inner pain and gut-churning when their mother came home late. And how when he looked up and caught their father's gaze, he saw the same bluntness and intransigence in it. People in pain look at life in terms of diminishing opportunities, he realized. So his first step was not to do it. The second step was to take care of the children. When Karen arrived home late, a spotless house awaited her. Two large pizza boxes were in the wastebasket. Homework was done, and the kids had already gone to bed. She couldn't find her husband, at least not until she looked out into the backyard there by the light of Corman's flashlight. He was sanding an old boat. She turned on the kitchen light, knowing it would be illuminated in the floor-to-ceiling windows. He looked up, but didn't wave his hand. She went to bed. Friday morning, he went out for a walk, covered in sweat from his jog. Karen was just getting ready to go out. Richard, she said, as if the impulse had suddenly swept over her. He felt the air between them. Ionize. I forgot to tell you that I'm going away on a business trip this weekend, she said. He nodded. There was no point in telling her not to do it. She had already done it with her mind and heart from what he had read. He knew that the act of cheating occurred when the cheater psychologically relegated his or her spouse to the level of someone to be deceived, manipulated, and misdirected. Almost all of them saw this as their merit or compensation for past wounds. And so they didn't just use their spouses. On some level, they hated them. Even if they couldn't admit it, Richard believed that society had two levels corresponding to ego and ID. The ID consisted of repressed desires left over from nature, and the ego consisted of how he explained them to himself as something good rather than bad. When he heard someone say, we are all equal, his mind translated that into me first. When they talked about patriotism or free markets, it meant, and others serve me when they talked about the sanctity of marriage. 
They meant neutralizing the man with rules that forced him to serve the woman. He thought Karen was different. He loved this shy, sensitive, and perceptive girl he'd first met at a church mixer since their first date. He hadn't told her about it for a while, adhering to the code of fair play that he and her father shared because he didn't want to put her in a difficult position or make her feel like she was being manipulated. He wondered if he was always wrong, or if something had finally caught up with her and threw her off balance. "'Is there anything I should know?' he asked softly. "'No, Richard, nothing.' she said with an annoyed look, then got in her car and drove off. Nothing. That was the feeling that descended upon his soul. An eternal and infinite void where nothing mattered except the sensations of the moment. He wanted to become one with the void, to purge his mind of everything and exist only in that crystalline structure of logic where every detail fit in the right place, forming lattices of knowledge, each level dependent on the one below. He wanted to separate himself from emotions, sensations, desires, and most importantly, from the realization of who he was and the situation he was in. Daddy asked Suzanne, looking into his eyes. Richard had come to his senses. Work was over. He had somehow managed and was now at home with his children. The clarity of his inner world connected to the wider world beyond his immediate concerns was a wonderful refuge. Emotions quickly returned to him or the feeling that he was watching a travesty from afar and a damp, blood-scented sense of profound loss. This too would pass, he reminded himself, and turned to his daughter. Are you okay? She, in her thin, trembling baby voice. Now that you're here, I'm perfectly fine. Richard said he went to work. He was doing well. He was great, even inspired. He had given the work all his nervous energy and his growing sense of despair, and the results were good. Now, he had his little charges to take care of, and he had an hour or so after work to put his thoughts in order. Then, he looked at his watch. Three hours had passed. And I'm late for dinner, he said. Kids, it's pizza time again. There was cheering, and they sat down to a few rounds of some hopelessly violent video game for boys, while Kyle read and Suzanne watched for the umpteenth time, a cartoon about a duck who saves the world with a chainsaw or something like that. Richard was a little distracted. The local pizza delivery guy recognized them well, mostly because Richard had tipped well in exchange for no small talk. And after a raucous pizza party, he tucked into bed. Homework would wait until Sunday afternoon. The next morning, they went to the zoo. Robert, a little too old for that, politely made his way through and lingered in the reptile house. Kyle was fascinated by the birds, and they went around the open cages three times at least. Suzanne tried her best to see all lions, tigers, bears, and otters, her favorites, but then became cranky. And after getting cotton candy, fell into a deep sleep in his arms, sending her father's shoulder into a deep sleep as well. Then, it was time for backyard games, throwing the old farm soccer ball around and playing horseplay until dusk descended on the land like a warm blanket. Richard dug into his college memories and made a dinner of organic hot dogs, bell peppers, spaghetti, cilantro, and pasta sauce that had a little sour cream to make it Alfredo-like. Then they'd read or play video games by the fire he'd built in a pit in the backyard while Richard continued polishing his boat. He glanced around the long backyard that stretched to the water of the fourth-class canal on the banks of which they lived, in a city bursting with waterways. He understood the benefits of having one of the posh homes in the famous lakeside communities, but he knew there was a price to pay for everything. Here they could live a normal life. No other normal people realized their unique abilities while humbly enjoying others and their contributions. He knew that everything he did— he did for the children, and if it killed him, he wouldn't let them live the way he lived. Richard never saw himself as a victim. He saw difficulties coming his way and went into a meditative state, which he learned, oddly enough, from his Methodist pastor as a child to figure out what was really going on. How does the situation work? Once he understood the structure, mechanism, and process that form the relationships between actions and consequences at every level, he could bypass the situation or make it work for him. He sighed, feeling mature, 
and perhaps more mature than he had that morning. Richard, the college boy with the mop of hair, big muscles and lust for life, would look at this quiet existence and laugh, then crush a few more cans of Milwaukee's best and go raise heck. Or maybe not. Somewhere Richard knew that's what he'd always wanted to do. He didn't believe in greatness and preferred ordinary life in which his mind was clear, so that if he had the opportunity to make some great invention or go down in history, he could seize the day without mental turmoil. They went to church on Sundays. Richard knew in his gut that he believed in God, even if he distrusted any book written by man because he understood cause and effect. The sky is dark at night, but dark skies can also be from the weather, a solar eclipse, or even the latest battle in Hama, Guido between the forces of order and fire. However, if the world as a whole is good, there can only be one thing causing it. And deep down, Richard had long ago found God and loved him, even if he hated organized religion as much as he hated politics and social media. He didn't bother to call his wife. Monday dawned early, and he put the kids in the car to drive to the local Korean Montessori school which was not so much Montessori as classical education with modern flexibility. When he went to school, the teacher's lounge smelled like coffee and cigarettes here. It smelled like yerba mate and weed. But like most realists, Richard didn't really believe in those categories. Some hippies were nice, just as some oil company executives were decent, honorable people. It was a complicated world, more complicated than emotions. Richard made friendly small talk as he went to work and then spent another good ten hours at the keyboard, telephone, and filing cabinet before returning home. Sue cast him a few wary glances, but he responded with a slightly absent smile that expressed pleasure in his work, combined with determination. When you're a boss, you have to lead for the good of your people, and if you have to deceive them, it has to be without exception in their own interest, even if they don't know it, he thought. Speaking of tyrants, his wife burst through the door late at night when dinner was already on the table and announced that she had eaten. Then ran off to take a shower. The children exchanged, knowing glances. Richard looked at his, who represented something between his wisdom and raw intelligence and his wife's passion, and realized that they could not be fooled. Listen, guys, he said, suddenly panting a little. You know I love you guys, right? They nodded looking at him with bright, moist eyes. I'll always be there for you and Mom, too, Richard said. If you trust me, don't worry about anything. We'll get through this. Surprisingly, it worked. Children, creatures of an age of innocence that peels off almost imperceptibly like onion skins, trusted the firm word of an adult who seemed to have a plan. He helped them with homework, helped them with the algebra he didn't know. He remembered and then put on his old fisherman's hat and headed for the boat. He wanted to take another look at the keel, and saw with new eyes that the crack could well have been something the builders hadn't noticed. Maybe a knot in the wood, or deep rot. He made a mental note to buy a replacement, and then began to take the boat apart. Maybe he could grease and sand the replacement wood some more, so the seals would be tighter, as he headed for the dumpsters with a pile of dead wood. He heard Karen talking on the phone. She was staring into the living room, oblivious to his presence. So he stopped to shift the pile of wood scraps he was carrying. When I got back this morning, she said, turning slightly to put the phone under her eye. I, she said, and stopped. He looked up and saw her eyes in the mirror on the wall leading into the living room. She was looking straight into his eyes. I mean, evening. She continued loudly, walking out into the next room and leaving behind whatever she was tidying up in the kitchen. That's when it all started. Richard leaned forward, scattering wood around him, and threw up on the small concrete plateau where the trash can stood. He vomited once, twice, three times, splattering a mixture of half-digested food, the soda he'd carelessly drank at work, and stomach fluid so acidic he could hear it hissing and cracking as it spread across the concrete. Finding nothing in his stomach, he wiped his mouth, then took a hose and sprayed the concrete, picking up the rotten wood, which now smelled faintly of phosphoric and hydrochloric acid. He tossed it into the trash can and the lid fell off listlessly. Up to this point, had suspicions. Now he knew it in his gut, but he had no proof. He wasn't even sure he wanted it, 
or that it mattered, but the part of him that was rigidly fair game insisted. He pondered these thoughts as he walked up the stairs. As soon as he entered the bedroom, however, he immediately ran to the bathroom, spewing more of his digestive contents. The vomiting made him so twisted that tears spurted from his eyes, and he fell to the floor. Strangely, he didn't feel sick. He just vomited with great force, and the rancid liquid flew into the toilet bowl. He didn't feel sick, but unreal, disconnected from the earth. His condition was like seasickness, or car sickness, or heartbreak. He realized, muttering something about not feeling well. He grabbed a pillow and flopped down on the couch. Soon, he was sound asleep. The day had gone surprisingly well. He managed to do a lot for a man whose life had been torn apart. He drank lots of water all day, did a great job, smiled whenever his three co-workers walked by, and came home early to make dinner for the kids. They were having a great time until Karen returned, at which point Richard rushed into the bathroom water in his eyes and saliva flowing from his mouth. He was squirming like a man rushing to suicide, his body thrashing back and forth, dots of light flashing in front of his eyes and his head spinning. This time, however, the guest room gave him no shelter, so he covered himself with a blanket and took the key to the boathouse. The simple cabin designed for boat storage had double doors, its own air conditioner, and a refrigerator for the beer parties he hoped to throw some day. He fell asleep on the old couch he'd gotten from his grandmother, wrapped in blankets, shivering not from the cold, but from the icy dread that came from within. The next morning, he waited until she left for work, then dropped the kids off at school and stopped by his office. He told Sue he would be working remotely, grab some files and his laptop, and turn to leave. "'Do you remember your rules of fair play, Mr. Thomas?' Sue asked. "'And about doing what's good for people, even if they don't know it.' She handed him the car keys. "'I've heard something, Mr. Thomas,' she said. "'I hope it's not true.' "'But if it is, you'll want to know every last gruesome detail, won't you? "'That's what all your friends have been saying. "'Richard takes the pain away.' So take my car, Tankful, and do whatever you need to do. She won't recognize it. He stared at the keys. Thanks, Sue. I owe you one, he said, as he handed her the keys. Unable to meet her gaze. Heck no, she whispered, as he walked away. He drove her tiny Honda, which surprisingly started to the small shopping center, nestled between the school and the church, where two real estate offices and an old colonial building with one-way mirrored windows housed an advertising agency parking at the church. He pulled out his binoculars and then wrote down the license plates and descriptions of the cars parked in the lot on his notepad. He wrote down the times. They came and went. Fortunately, the office didn't have an enclosed parking lot, so when Jeb came out, Richard could clearly see Karen get into the car. He took a few pictures with Daniel's old camera. Once they were gone, he didn't do anything about it. The light cycle had trapped them. So he waited a couple of minutes before he slipped out and almost caught up with him at the next light, keeping a dozen cars behind. He used binoculars over one eye, so he knew when they were honking he drove another block, turned onto a side street and spotted them in the distance, catching up. He knew this part of town well enough to guess where they were headed. The old Bayou Ridge Hotel at the edge of the woods. That's where I'd go if I wanted to have a sad affair, he thought. Finally, the little Honda pulled into the parking lot, and he got the shots he wanted the two kissing in the car, entering the motel room and leaving. An hour later, he let them go, then lazily drove back to the office. They were just coming inside. He saw Karen lift her head and look around as if she had caught the warning, but then walked through the door. He thanked Sue again in his heart for having the foresight to buy him an anonymous car after sending the children to bed. Richard began his nightly ritual in the boathouse. If he stayed too long in the main house, he would have the first signs of a hepatitis attack. Saliva flooding his mouth, eyes watering. Once he got to the quiet of the boathouse where the waves beat against the small seawall twenty feet away. He managed to fall sound asleep on the huge, massive couch his grandmother had bought decades ago. He sensed she was still watching over him and crossed his fingers that everything would go well. I wondered what Karen was thinking about all this. Her husband vomited profusely in her presence, didn't spend time with her on weekends, 
and didn't seem to notice her hobbies. They hadn't had much love before the affair, but it had died down afterward, also because her husband vomited profusely whenever he was in her presence. It took Richard several months to realize what had happened and begin to confront it. One of the links bookmarked on her computer. Yes, you can find the second Windows account because there is another folder for it in the user directory that you can see if you boot. The recovery disk in administrator mode described how to essentially shame or deceive your man. You broke his trust, made him find out about cheating and accept it, and then ended all affection, but commanded him daily in the matter. He would come to his senses, she promised. The article left a bad taste in his mouth, written by some purple-haired man with a manly face and wild eyes that showed three white sides behind thick glasses. The article was written in a jubilant tone. Men, it said, had been killing women, enslaving them and controlling them for centuries. Now it was time to strike back, destroying the obviously the good ones. It reveled in manipulation and belittlement. At that moment, Richard realized that his marriage was truly dead because no one who loved him would treat him this way. It was abuse, and his wife was an abuser. He remembered his school counselor warning boys against men who wanted to be their friends. Someone who does something that is not in your best interest, but serves their best interest, is not a friend that's a predator or a parasite, or at least someone who wants to use you. And that's not love. That is never love. Get away from that person as soon as possible. A story that is rarely told in matters of infidelity, whether sexual or simply a refusal to respect a spouse that forms the absolute emotional and moral bond that allows a marriage to work, is the story of children. How does it affect them? Let's look at it with one eye. Robert, Kira, and Suzanne called Daniel at the college to tell him what had happened. Dad lives in the boathouse. Robert said, annoyed at how thin and clipped his voice sounded. Mom spends all her time at work, including nights, especially nights, and she's away on business trips a lot. Daniel sighed. I was worried about that, he said. Mom's always had self-esteem issues because she rushed into marriage and missed out on what her friends were doing, partying her butt off in college, like in the sisterhood of the traveling pants, having lots of boyfriends, going to little villas in Italy, like an under-the-Tuscan sun. Having adventures like an eat, pray love. She acts like she's living in The Handmaid's Tale or The Hunger Games. I think she's worried that a movie about her life isn't covered enough. She's not really there for us, Kaya says. We have to find her to talk to her. And she's gone all the time. She's home. All my friends' moms are there on nights and weekends, Suzanne piped up, and she's just not here. It's like she's abandoned us. Daniel thought for a moment. What will Dad say? He keeps saying he'll never leave us, Robert says. He's always there for us. When we go to bed, he goes to the boathouse and sleeps there. Trust my family to be totally weird, Daniel said with a laugh. Well... That's about it. They've got problems, but you've got your daddy. It's no different than what happened to Davis and Shelley when their mom went to a personal trainer at her gym, or when Kristen's mom went to live with her boss, or even Jake's house, where his dad has a new girlfriend and his mom has an apartment near the mall. So what do we do? Kaya asked to do. Daniel hesitated. Welcome to adulthood, kid. Other people are going to throw you for a loop. Daddy won't. He's too fair and generous. Mom will probably come back after her little adventure. But it'll be like when Roger's mom ran off with that traveling preacher and then came back. And things will never be the same again. Or when Kara's parents had an open relationship, and now they're like roommates. Or, you know how our neighbor started dating her therapist. And when she came back, things were kind of flat unloving with her husband. Stay close to your dad and get out as soon as you can. Go to college or the Air Force or something. What is a loose relationship? inquired Susanna. I'll tell you later, Kayla said quickly. Later, when you turned 18, she thought. Thanks, Dan, Robert said. We'll take it from here. That sounded more mature than he thought it would. Back on the canal, Richard finally got the boat afloat. He replaced the keel and many of the planks. But the old sailboat gleamed and had a beautiful wood grain. He remodeled and rebuilt the cabin replaced the motor which he suspected had simply died of metal fatigue and moved down the canal to take the wind on the lake. 
He pondered an old myth the ship in which Theseus and the Athenian youth returned from Crete had thirty oars, and was preserved by the Athenians, down to the time of Demetrius Valerius, for they removed the old planks as they became dilapidated, putting in their place new and stronger ones, so that this ship became a constant example among philosophers in the logical question of what grows. One side maintained that the ship remained the same, and the other that it did not. First, Plutarch Theseus. He'd changed a few boards in his life too, but now things were more solid than ever. He wasn't going to sink because of the decisions of someone who clearly no longer cared about him and hadn't for a long time. Even though the old boat was only six feet long, he had rediscovered the joy he had felt sailing with his grandfather and then his father, and found that old skills were also coming back quickly. Karen walked in the door after another hard day's work. Despite what Jeb had told her over the years, the workload hadn't diminished, and her firm didn't seem to be going any higher than it had been. The press favored them with many fine articles about their beneficial work in third-world countries, but the money wasn't coming in as fast as she expected. Her head was starting to throb, but she wanted a drink instead. To her surprise, she saw Richard sitting at the kitchen table. Richard, she said. How? Pills. He said the doctor found something that interrupts the gag reflex. I went to doctors for years looking for the cause of my vomiting, but they were all puzzled. One finally asked if I vomited at night, and I said no. He figured that if it wasn't happening when I slept, then it was my head and not my stomach. They did a brain scan, I mean an MRI, which was horrible. But no tumors were found. It's just a psychological condition, and it's always been like that. I don't even have an ulcer. Apparently, it's a common reaction to stress. This medication shuts down the gagging for a few hours so we can talk. So she said, what are we talking about today? It's not a big deal. Richard said quietly, the kids are gone and it's time for us to think about the future. We're both gaining seniority, so it's time to protect our assets. The papers before you concern the creation of a corporate trust in our names that will manage our assets and shield us from legal liability. Especially since your firm is playing close to the edge of the law, and the rumors about it are getting thicker and thicker. Let me tell you, we need insulation. Have your attorney review it and return a signed copy to me, if I may. She looked at the papers, scanning them with an experienced eye. It was indeed a legal trust registered in their state with their attorney as one of the founders. By the way, thanks for asking about me, Richard said. I'm still living in the boathouse and having a great time. You wouldn't recognize the place with all the renovations I've done. It even has its own mailbox. He waited for her to realize what that meant. I don't know if I need this, she said, looking at the papers. We're doing fine as it is. I'll sign it. And if I do... I'll need to start taking my income out of my family finances and putting it into a trust. That way, you will only have your paycheck left. Keep in mind that the trust includes our 400 and K plans, so this will protect those as well. In addition, the trust will pay the children an income that may not be enough to live on, but will be enough to get a little boost in life after we pass away. Okay, I'll take this to my lawyer, Karen said. Thank you. Richard said. With those words, he walked away. He returned to his usual relaxed demeanor in the office. Sue had waited six months to make her move. Richard had just finished working on the final account for one of their oldest clients, and when he turned around, she was standing in the doorway, the early afternoon, sunlight streaming in through the window behind her. She looked nervous, her fingers dancing lightly on the outside of the folder. Sue Richard said, What can I do for you? I'm glad you're back, she said. Neither of them needed to explain anything. In the last few months, it seemed as if they knew each other like old battle buddies. She could anticipate his thoughts. He knew her vocabulary, what words she liked to use, what they meant, and how to gauge her confidence in this or that. And she seemed to do the same for him. If only he had met her first, he reflected. But that was impossible, and he would never get his children back. No, this was just another dream, a pipe dream. Yeah, what's done is done, he said. I've actually gotten over it. People on the internet told me I was going to experience rage and I was experiencing sadness. 
People told me I would drink a lot of bad whiskey, but I still think it tastes like cough medicine. People said you'd never get over it, but if I had any revenge, it was this. I'm over it. Everything I do now, I do for the children. What about you? Sue asked, raising an eyebrow. She was very glad to have her old boss back. Vintage horror movies, he said, then grinned, looking at her shocked face movie Sue. I love old horror movies from the 1960s through the mid-90s, because after that, everything went to the Blair Witch, or E.M. Night Shyamalan. Karen hated them, and said they made her feel scared, like when her father and mother fought when she was a kid. So I just gave up, put it aside. Now I'm making up for lost time. He told her about the boathouse, the big screen TV with surround sound and other details he was incorporating into his arc after Karen life after Karen. But why did you come to see me? Sue flushed. I'm in the process of finding new business, she said. But it's complicated. A potential client was once in a merger with another firm. But now that the merger has partially dissolved, may be open to new business. However, their former business partner wants that segment of their business. Here I am wondering if it would be fair to throw my name out, even though the two firms are still technically related. Richard was looking at her with typical male confusion, she thought. They take the world literally as if everything around them were a woolly mammoth to be hunted, or a saber-toothed tiger threatening a tribe in its cave. Only men could invent fire, she realized. But then they would burn everything in a primal, childish delight, and then only talk about the various uses of flame. If the client is cooperative, he said slowly, and the merger is really dead, I'd go for it. But when he looked up, she was no longer there. After work back at the boathouse, he chopped wood and pondered the conversation. Who the heck was she? Gradually it came to him. He felt a new feeling inside him, mixed with excitement and awe. Of course, she hadn't meant it, but if she had, he stood up abruptly, then sat down and replayed the whole thing in his head. Thirty minutes later, he made dinner for his children and took the car keys. He turned to the children, guilt written all over his face. Go on. Robert said, whatever you were doing, you didn't look alive like that for, I don't know, four weeks. And then he burst into tears. Richard pulled him against him and swore he would keep his emotions in check for the sake of his children. The innocence brought to the altar by an act of gross desecration of what he thought was a good marriage. As night fell, and the birds were replaced by the hum of insects and the quiet sound of sprinklers, he rounded the corner of the sidewalk, leading to the apartment on the west side of town. Sheffield's apartment occupied a large stretch of one of the dreary east side streets he'd ever encountered. But it was a safe and quiet neighborhood. He checked the address on her phone and headed for the apartment located on the west side of the large, sprawling complex. She opened the door before he knocked. Did you get my message? she said. I'm stupid. He began in an apologetic voice. But you came anyway. She asked why. Hope, he whispered. When we first spoke, it was clear to me that you were a who and not a what. You had vitality, honesty, and direction. One door closed. You opened another. You went in there head first and told me the honest truth. At a time when looking back, I was surrounded by lies. I was impressed. And I'm still impressed. And today, I try never to fraternize with co-workers, especially since I am married. But she is, is over. It, except that she provides stability for my children, whom I love more than anything. He finished in a whisper. Richard shook his head to clear the air. I had hoped not believed that you were asking me how I would act in your situation. You conveyed the message, unless I misunderstood it, that maybe I wouldn't be the bad guy in this equation. And I was hoping until I realized that what you said, if that's what you said, made perfect, flawless, bloodless sense. She handed him some kind of soft drink. He took a sip. It was a Dr. Pepper clone from Costco that was better than the real thing. He took another. Thank you, he said. What's done is done. And wherever I stumble, I'll never know if I ever do. Sometimes things don't go well. A storm comes and the chicks fall out of the nest. And you find them the next when it's too late. God's hand. Or an aimless materialistic universe. I don't know. Nor do I think it's my purpose to know. But damn it, I'm delusional. 
You've always been in my thoughts as one of the most real people I've ever met. What about Karen? she asked. What about Alex? he asked. Karen sighed. And here you are making me admit the lie from the start. Alex isn't into women, if you know what I mean. He's my ballet teacher. I do it as a hobby because I enjoy it. I asked him to help put out the fire in the office because I saw the way you looked at me that time. And I knew. And I didn't want to be the other woman. And so hope was lost. I see, Richard said. I must have read it all wrong. No, she said. Things have changed. I'm not going to treat your wife like an imbecile. She made a choice. And she knows the kind of man you are. She's gone, Richard. Honestly, I could slap that stupid jerk. But I believe in the old parable. Never thought your enemy when he makes a mistake. She picked up a soft drink and took a big gulp. So I don't, began Richard, frowning his eyebrows. No, Sue said. I've known about it for months. I think you do too. He stepped forward and pressed his forehead against hers. Hope. He said it's going to kill you every time. Not this time, she said, taking his hands. Not in my life. They talked about something, and he came to his senses on the couch, sat down next to her and took her hand. This is unusual, but I'm an ordinary girl, she said. The last thousand years, maybe more, have been a mistake. There's nothing wrong in the rule book, but if you don't mind things happening slowly, I'll... We will make it work. The whole time they were holding hands. Hours later, he turned off the engine and stopped the car, taking the risk of not waking anyone and just running across the road. It was the most magical night of his life. From the depths of darkness to the heights of a mountain, bathing in the sunlight of a spring morning and not even a kiss. He'd held her until it was clear. What's done is done. And now they were conspirators on a mission of hope, a mission of faith, lost in a world of men intoxicated with power and obsessed with death. Could it possibly work? He fell asleep running the thought through his head. She made the rules. Never in the office, never in public, and never in front of his children. They would remain a secret. But she was, as she put it, with a fierce look reminiscent of her Norman and Scottish ancestors. All business. A moment later, he said the same thing, enunciating the words clearly so that no one, not his beloved, not the wizards of time, not the gods of the glades and fields could understand his meaning. Choices forever, he realized. And at any moment, it could all come crashing down like those moments that had ruined his marriage. At any moment, one could step back from the abyss. But that abyss, he felt, was dark. Only on the outside. But inside was full of light. They met in the evenings, after the kids had gone to bed in his improving boathouse. He liked to cook for her, but sometimes they would just sit and talk. He learned about her past, the shy, honey-haired girl who wrote well, but never fit in socially. And he learned that she was a black belt in Grace's jiu-jitsu. She elicited things from him that Karen never thought to ask, like how he spent his summers on a volunteer fire department in the Piney Woods. Their personal vocabulary grew, and with it, their affection grew. One evening... Sitting on the couch and holding hands, they both realized that the time had come. Not a word was spoken. They got up and went to the bedroom where he showered her with kisses. Then they made real love. And then they fell asleep, pressed against each other in the cozy hollow between his chest and thighs. Eventually, he mustered up the courage to confess his feelings to her. It happened in a strange way. But I love you, Sue Scott. She burst into tears and ran out of the boathouse. He ran after her, but she raised her hand, which was a signal that it was time to linger and left depressed. Richard returned to the boathouse. How could he have riled her with what he thought was a positive thing? She was absent at work, not aloof or cold. She just wasn't around. He divided himself between work and furtively cast glances in her direction. Questions swamped his mind, and he fought for control. Sometimes the good guys don't win. He remembered his father's words when his work was done. He stood up and mechanically made his way to the garage. There he sat in the car for a few minutes, trying to comprehend what was beating in his head, or maybe in his heart. He drove home to feed the children and listen with a manly air to stories about soccer and math class, about the boy who pulled his pigtail rotten and the diorama of the Battle of Hastings. 
When they fell asleep, he crawled, as was his custom to the boathouse. She stepped out of the shadow of the wall into the light. I can't do that, she said. It's like leading a secret life that no one can see. I can never be who I want to be, your wife and the mother of your children, and so no one can see who I am inside. And why this choice is important to me. He wrapped his arms around her, pulling her against his chest and arms, and rocked her gently as she cried. The next day's work was as torturous as the day before. When Sue returned from lunch, she found a houseplant on her desk with a single purple flower peeking out from its moth-eaten, sun-bleached leaves. Most women would have thought there had been some mistake and tossed the pathetic plant in the trash, but Sue knew the language of her new love and went to the corner store instead. While her co-workers watched with open mouths, she reported the plant scattering soil over the table, then trimmed the dead vegetation and watered what was left. She put the plant in the light, cleaned up, and went back to work. That evening, when Richard was aimlessly but leisurely for his children, were waiting for him at home. He felt her presence, rather than saw it. If you want to leave, I understand, he said, surprised that it sounded more like a growl than the affectionate tone he had planned. She slipped out from behind the column. It doesn't work in my mind, she said, but it works in my heart. I love you, Richard Thomas, but inside, I'm upside down. He hugged her again. To know the words was to know when they would yield nothing but confusion. He was sorry. He realized he was afraid for her. He was crushed, but instead, he just hugged her and felt her pulse with his skin. The next day, he stopped by her house an hour before lunch. She followed him silently, and they got into the car. He drove cautiously, up to a slightly battered church on the far side of town. A good-natured man with salt-and-pepper-colored hair over a cassock stepped out of the glass-covered door. He or she is, he said, holding out his hands. She's everything I could have hoped for. How are you, my dear? Richard took a seat in the sanctuary and stared at the place behind the altar where generations had worshipped. Father. Mother poured her tea in his study, talking softly as he did so. About Richard and the long-ago divorce about a family so thoroughly destroyed that he'd set aside two plots in the cemetery, and about the kind of man this young man had become fighting every step of the way. Hiding it all from everyone, accepting the pain and drawing strength from it. I don't know what to do, Sue said. My heart leans one way, and all the practitioners I know say it's impossible. Father Muller nodded slowly. If you were stranded on a desert island thousands of miles from everyone you knew with no hope of rescue, would you be with him? Of course, Sue said. Then tell me, he said. What do you think marriage really is? Sue hesitated. It's a multitude of things. It's a lifelong bond. It's a promise. I think it's a legal contract as well as a contract with God. He grinned. I don't know why he brought you here. I'm a terrible, heretical priest. I spend most my time reading Buddhist theory and ancient Greek literature. I disagree with them that we show our faith to God by doing pious and charitable deeds and thereby earn a place in heaven. I think we do that by making hard decisions like this one and doing what is best for everyone in the material world. Since God put us here for a reason, and in my opinion, that is the development of souls through suffering, including choices like this one. The priest sipped his tea and continued, they call my viewpoint sola fide, or alone, implying that faith is not about charity, but about making yourself right. If your heart is pure and your mind is clear, you will do right here on earth. And just as right, it will be in heaven. We cannot show God our faith, but we must live it. That is the difference between love and a marriage ceremony. Life is random and has no plan. Stuff happens. And how we deal with it says a lot about who we are. He quoted eight. For by grace, you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Nine not have works, lest anyone should boast. First, Ephesians 2.89 In other words, religion is fine, but when it replaces practical, realistic thinking, it's already a mental illness, he said. We can guess at what heaven wants, but it's clear that you both love each other very much and need to be together. This creates a conflict between ego, 
or your sense of self-worth as measured by others, and ed, or your inner desire to not only love this person, but to possess them. But the ego is attached to bragging, and only the ID knows true faith. Father Muller sipped his tea and continued, That means that if deep down you love this man forever, then in God's eyes you're married. I think you're already married, by the way, and the rest of the species can shove their opinions where the sun don't shine. Besides, I have a few suggestions as to how you can get of this situation. Later, after thanking Father Muller, she joined Richard in the sanctuary. They drove back to the office together. Sue broke the silence. You're right. He did help me clear things up. It's my pain of not having a big white wedding where my family will finally see me as more than just a loser and all my friends will ooing and eyeing and I'll finally feel like I'm somebody. That's what makes me afraid. Time moved on. The plant in her office grew, was replanted several times, and eventually became a small bush in the corner. Every evening, Richard tended to his children, and then went to the newly built, comfortable boathouse, and made slow, tender love to Sue. He bought her an emerald and diamond ring, made a new group of friends who knew her as his wife, and got the business to buy the apartment where she lived with their rapidly brood. That weekend, he and Robert took a tin skiff with a fishing line into the water, an activity his son had called fish hunting from an early age, much to the amusement of his father and his fishing buddies. I never want to get married, Robert said. Richard chose his words carefully, as he often did, knowing that children memorize every remark their parents make casual or memorized, often for life. When talking to his children, Richard realized that he was not only Richard, but he was a parent a general or daddy to his family, and he had to be right every time. Marriage is the hardest thing I've ever done, Richard says, but it's also one of the best things I've ever done in my life, if not the best. I brought you guys out of it, and you're not many versions of me in my mind, but your own people continue the best of what my mother and I had. But mom's never home, Robert said. It's like you're not married at all. I love your mother, and always will. Richard said she made a choice that it's hard to say how things will work out in the end, made things more complicated. I always love her and forgive her, but her choices have consequences. Robert watched the fishing line on the water. So that's why you live in the boathouse, and Mrs. Sue comes to see you at night. You can never fool them, Richard thought. Yes, they are, he said. She's a good friend. Is she going to be our mom? Robert asked. No, Richard said. It's a little unconventional, but I think most lives are like that. Being both normal and dealing with the difficulties arise. She's my friend, and your mom is your mom. She always will be. We'll be a family, but just as your mom has her own needs and wants, so do I. Robert thought for a while. Okay. He said finally, that makes sense. So now I have two moms? Yeah, pretty much. Richard said fishing out what turned out to be a soft drink and overgrown with weeds. At this, they laughed and turned the boat back down the canal to their house. Robert went to his friends, and Richard returned to his little house on the water with the ruined farmhouse behind him. So that's what you've been doing? Karen began approaching the boathouse. Richard was polishing that stupid sailboat like he always seemed to do, though she had to admit he was further along. It's nice that you're interested in what I'm doing. Richard said, puffing on his pipe to keep it lit while he applied another coat of oil to the wood drying in the sun. This boat has been in the shed for too many years, and perhaps it always had some, how shall I put it, internal flaws. But I threw out the parts that shouldn't have been and replaced them with new wood. I signed the document, she said, holding it out to him. Rodolfo, my lawyer, said it was a pretty standard document and a good way to protect our money but the corporate liability seemed odd to him. What if we donate 10% of any profits to the Arboretum? Richard thought about it, but his eyes remained wary. At moments like this, they regained the luster they'd had before he'd learned of her infidelity. No, the morality clause, and more to the point, the need for contributions. Karen said, Sounds like you want to take over my paycheck and 401k. A trust only works if we put our entire fortune in it. Richard said, I send everything I earn into it as I did with this marriage. That's why I signed it, Karen said. But I asked Rodolfo to add a clause stating that any personal purchases I made would be paid for out of my income before deductions. 
Richard hesitated for a moment. If the same applies to me, I don't mind, he said. That way we'll be equal and all that. After all, he had anticipated her request. Okay, she said as she walked away. Just make the changes. She congratulated herself on another successful business interaction. But in the back of her mind flashed the thought that Richard was a professional negotiator after all. Richard vomited a continuous stream of green onto the grass, then hesitantly stood up to grab the hose. Ten years flew by. When Suzanne left for college with the intention of studying compiler design and machine learning, Richard felt a sense of pride. All four of his children took up interesting endeavors. Robert, to his surprise, went into the Marines and was going for professional certifications in HVAC and IT to manage network, to scout a systems for climate control and warehouses. Kayo got a scholarship to a private college, and Daniel broke free and went into his own plumbing business for luxury homes and corporate rentals, making more money than he knew what to do with. Suzanne was starting high school. One sunny afternoon, Karen rushed toward the boathouse in a rage, but then stopped. What was this procedure? She knocked on the double doors. They turned out to be unlocked, and she stepped inside, clutching a thin folder in her hands. What in the name of all that is holy? She exhaled. Someone had replaced the old rickety boards with new ones, with grooves, and then planked everything. The house had a small bathroom, albeit with a composting toilet and electricity. He had an office, a kitchenette, a secluded bed in the former attic, and the coziest living room cups he'd ever seen with leather couches angled toward the TV. The full-size refrigerator she checked was full of meat, beer, and occasional vegetables that probably suffered from self-esteem issues. Did he throw parties here? It looked like it. For a moment, Karen felt she had been left behind. Irrelevance had taken its toll on her sense of self. She no longer mattered to her husband. When she noticed the women's clothes bras in the dresser next to the bed, she realized in an instant that she had been replaced. What's more, this small room the size of a two-car garage, seemed more cozy and inviting than the house she'd lived for years. He had even framed drawings that each of the children had made at school and pictures of himself and the children on outings. She didn't remember being invited to. There was a framed quote hanging on the wall. I advise you to be on your guard, but I've never been afraid to be especially careful with alcohol about other men's women and the third about men in their temptation to steal. First half a mile, 131. She heard the boat pull up to the dock, her husband stepping out of it and walking along the planks of the dock, which sounded as if they were new, not faded and rotten as they had been years ago. Hi, he said as he walked through the door. So do you like this place? Very nice, Karen said dreamily, then focused again. What the heck is this? She said, holding out a folder to him. Adoption papers for your secretaries? No, Sue is my vice president, not my secretary. Richard said slowly. He tried to make his next words as soft as possible. They are my children, too, but now they will take my last name and become part of our family so they can have their share of the trust. You had kids with that stupid jerk. What the heck? Karen stopped halfway through the sentence. That's exactly right, Richard said. You left me in life. Went on without you counseling. Karen muttered. I want to, but she stopped again. He clutched the card between his first two fingers. We have an appointment this Wednesday. Richard turned to the table, shook out the contents of his pockets onto it, and remained in that position until he heard her pumps buzz and then rushed to run toward the house on the lake. As always, night was slowly falling and the fireflies came out to play in the tall grass. Being far away from the hustle and bustle of the roads to survive. A few days later, Richard pulled up to a large house in the center of town. It had once been a family home, but like so much that was organic in nature, it had been displaced by commerce and the inexorable march of progress. Richard no longer trusted his definition and now housed an office where a consultant rented space. I'm Dr. Raoul Winslow, and we're here with Mr. Richard Thomas and his wife, Mrs. Karen Thomas. This is being recorded for the protection of my clients and myself. Now, there was a knock on the door. Richard answered it. I'm Nick Randall, Mr. Thomas's attorney, said a tall man in a sleek suit. I'm here at my client's request to protect his interests and explain what's going on here. 
Karen looked at the three men in the room. She had chosen Dr. Winslow, a traditionalist Catholic with feminist leanings, because he defended women while supporting men's obligations in marriage to reconcile at all costs. Now, the psychiatrist looked worried. Karen is here. Richard began slowly, then switched topics. My wife found out that I've been living with another woman in our backyard for the last ten years and took three children from her. Holy crap, Dr. Winslow said, then regained his professional expression. And you didn't tell her about it because she was busy and didn't notice. Richard said his lawyer, Nick, began handing out copies of the photos taken outside the motels, each labeled with the year, month, and day. There were quite a few of them. You all along? Karen asked incredulously. Richard cast a pitying glance at her. When you love someone, you know their moods. You even know when they're to fall out of love with you and keep you around just to finance the house and the kids, Nick said quietly. After the affair was discovered, my client placed his income and his wife's retirement portfolios in trust to protect them from events of this nature. You'll notice there's a morals clause on page 3 of the agreement that states that any member of the agreement who engages in publicly disreputable activities forfeits their share and is entitled to only a nominal payment of $25,000 per year. Dr. Winslow looked puzzled. But if you knew about this case, Nick said he knew she had done it once but didn't think. She would do it again. When she repeated the process, my client realized that his wife had forfeited her share, and furthermore, that she had violated the contract underlying the trust as she continued to live in the house and spend the proceeds of his earnings on things for herself. He held out a sheet of paper documenting dozens of purchases. My client realized that, in essence, she wanted the contract to remain in effect, except for the spousal fidelity clause. He took a deep breath that gave my client the legal right to seek similar life partners, and he began a relationship with Ms. Sue Scott, with whom, as mentioned, he has three children and is now seeking Mrs. Thomas's consent to adopt them so they can bear his name and be considered in the eyes of the state as children born in wedlock. His decision to create the trust has proven to be shrewd, as we have credible information that Mrs. Thomas and Mr. Sheehan are using company funds for their long-running affair. Dr. Winslow turned pale as things were not going at all as he had expected, and like most psychiatrists, he knew no more than what the textbooks had taught him, even if he considered most of it abstruse gibberish. After all, over the century, psychotherapy had led to more mental illness in the population not less, but he would never tell his clients that. Let's take step back, he said, in a voice usually reserved for kindergarten children and the feeble-minded. Richard, you noticed your wife cheating on you, and instead of trying to resolve the issue, you retaliated. No, Dr. Richard said. I've tried many times to talk my wife out of infidelity. I exercised, updated my closet, tried taking her to fancy restaurants, coaxed her to talk to me, engaged in back-rubbing and cunnilingus. But nothing worked. Despite my legendary linguistic abilities, once it became clear that the affair was not a one-and-done, but a permanent replacement for me in the marital role, I deemed that part of the contract null and void on my part, and found my own replacement for the absent and unsmiling Mrs. Thomas. Nick spoke again. At this time, my client was documenting Mrs. Thomas's process of leaving, he bought replacements for his toiletries, clothing, and personal items, then renovated the boathouse to make it a second home, at which point he visited the main house, only to cook, clean up after himself, read and socialize with his children. Nick held out another piece of paper to Winslow. This is a copy of my client's application for a second street address for the boathouse, confirming it as a second household. Mrs. Thomas apparently didn't notice care that he was no longer receiving mail at the main house and that his property never changed its location. I also have a photograph of his toiletries with various expiration almost a decade old. We're getting ahead of ourselves, Dr. Winslow said. Karen, you should have an attorney review this document. However, we're here to do marriage counseling. Is there any way for you to, to work things out, like having dinner together? I can't, Richard said. Can't or won't? Dr. Winslow asked. I can't. I have a weird stomach illness. When I'm around her, I vomit repeatedly and violently. It's debilitating. 
and the meds to suppress it make me feel gross for days. Apparently, they are hard on the liver. What about outside? Winslow went on, desperate to find a way to escape, and still bill for a full session. He, too, had a sailboat. And as they say, boats are holes in the water into which large sums of money are thrown. How about a vacation somewhere tropical? Richard considered this. If I schedule a vacation, will you sign the adoption papers? He nodded to Nick, who, like a consummate professional, didn't let his smile go from his soul to his face. Yes, Karen said. Then it's right, Richard said, true to her word. Karen signed and certified the paperwork and the adoption process supported by Sue Scott, who realized the complexity of Richard's situation from the start, began its slow movement through the creaking gears of an expensive but mysteriously underfunded bureaucracy. Richard left his plane ticket under her pillow. He thought about putting away all the old expired toiletries and clothes, many of which hung loosely on him, but constricted his new, larger biceps and calves, but dismissed the thought. Instead, he went to the dock and launched the boat. Later, Karen picked up her ticket and smiled. Maybe this would work. She could have her cake and eat it too. However, when she arrived at the airport two days later in the morning, Richard was nowhere to be seen, confused. She went through security where she was only cursorily searched and took a seat at the gate. Several hours passed, and as the plane began to land, she became nervous. Picking herself up, she turned around. Jeb, she said. It was nice to meet you here, Karen. He asked. She looked down and noticed he was holding the exact same ticket. I found it on my desk, he said. I thought you wanted to finally take that. We've always talked about. Karen smiled warmly. Let's go, she said. To heck with Richard. In his little games, she thought she would have Rodolfo tear him apart when she returned. Holding hands, they boarded the plane. The fish weren't biting on the canal, so Richard went to the house and equipped himself. He called Nick throughout the day. Calls came in on the client list that Karen had carelessly left on her laptop. Each of them looked as follows. Lawyer, legal, department of client name. How can I help you, Nick? Hello, this is Nick Randall from Mulhern and Rankin. I'm calling regarding our upcoming litigation against the advertising firm that employs Jeb Sheehan. And I'm wondering if your firm was aware of an ongoing affair between Mr. Sheehan and his subordinate, Karen Thomas, in which we intend to deal with allegations of misuse of client funds. Were you aware of the extramarital relationship between these two? And did you ever notice any accounting irregularities in their billing practices? Counselor, I have to look into this matter. We will get back to you. He didn't get a call back, but the message was relayed later at the end of the workday. Nick and Richard found themselves in front of the board of directors of Jeb's advertising firm. Nick began, It has come to our attention that Mr. Sheehan has been having an affair with his subordinate, Karen Thomas, for over a decade. We have found documents on Mrs. Thomas's computer that indicate that mixed funds, if not company funds, may have been used to finance the affair, including lavish weekend trips. We intend to sue for damages to Thomas's business as a result of the publicity of this affair and the loss of trust that caused potential clients to shun the firm, and witnesses are expected to testify about it. According to numerous testimonies, Mr. Sheehan and Mrs. Thomas were openly having an affair in the office with the approval of the firm, and we can assume the board of directors. We would like to know if you have a settlement offer. While he was saying this, a secretary came into the room and whispered in the ear of the chairman of the board. Richard could only assume it was another rejection from a client as everyone involved tried to escape the legal storm of steel and feces that was rapidly approaching them. The chairman turned white-red. We'll be in touch, he said. Richard and Nick allowed themselves to be led out the door. Message delivered. Nick said once they were out of. Two weeks later. When Karen returned home, she was in a bad mood. On their second day in Tahiti, emails came from the legal department reprimanding both her and Jeb. No one had lost their jobs, but it was clear that their careers were going nowhere. After this fiasco by board decision, Jeb was no longer a director of his own company. Jeb became furious and ruined the rest of his vacation by calling his lawyers and ranting about how they couldn't do that to him. 
Then he called his wife to explain, and Karen headed to the beach with a cocktail. Hold them, she said to the cowboy. Please. She slipped him fifty dollars. As soon as the plane landed, Jeb disappeared. Karen would never see him outside of work again. The next morning, Nick and Richard, dressed in matching suits, stood in front of Jeb and his lawyer. We intend to sue for defamation for the allegations made against my client, the attorney began. Great, Nick said. And what's more? Wait, what? the lawyer asked. You're new at this? Nick said. I've been doing this for decades. You sue us. We get the evidence. For starters, we need Mr. Sheehan's schedule. His expense reports on all business trips on the dates we specify and access to interviews of any employees who may have heard Mrs. Thomas and Mr. Sheehan discussing the affair in the office. The lawyer turned pale. We'll be in touch. In the meantime, Karen started looking for work, but found that every advertising firm in North America had received a letter of inquiry from a lawyer demanding details of her affair with Mr. Sheehan and the possibility of using mixed or company funds to finance meetings between the lovers in Las Vegas, Paris, New York, and Atlantic City. Not surprisingly, no one wanted to hire her for a position above janitor, and even then, only on the condition that she take a rigorous ethics course that she had to finance on her own. Richard swept across the house and handed her a check. This is your 25 case for a year's maintenance, he said. The house is, and the children will be taken care of. You're welcome. After recovering from the shock, Karen followed him into the boathouse with a sagging jaw. I never realized you were so immature, she said. You're burning me out instead of trying to deal with this like an adult. I tried, Richard said quietly as he untied the boat. You may remember I spent a lot of time trying, but you didn't want to listen. So what if you ruin my life? Richard tossed the rope aside. Let me tell you something, Karen. On our wedding day, I looked into your eyes and saw what I thought was the path to happiness. Love, a family, support at a major job to pay for it all. A lake house, retirement and traveling the world, and then spending our golden years in contentment and joy, visiting our grandchildren and pampering them. It was what I wanted, he continued. These are all things you will never get of your own, free will. You treated me like a servant or one of your office lackeys. You threw away our love and with it our future. Betraying a spouse can be endless, but the worst part is that despised me. You treated me like an enemy. All I did was tell the story so the whole world would know that I was not a cuckold, but a man who would put up with it. Their gazes met for a moment. Karen realized at once that she had never really trusted him, because who could trust a reckless animal that no woman could control? Richard saw years of crying, children terrified by the breakup of their family, and the arrogance with which Karen ruled like a tyrant who gained power through his career. Anger flickered for a moment. To heck with her, he thought. To heck with Hitler and to heck with Stalin. And to heck with everyone who lied for power, including every American leader since March 16, 1861. Richard sighed and smoked his pipe. I'm not a martyr, Karen, as a wise man said. There was only one true Christian, and he died on the cross. Perhaps I am Siddhartha under the body tree, or Odin hanging upside down with a missing eye. I am one who learns from my mistakes. Your actions robbed me of what I wanted, and I have sought it elsewhere. But I refuse to divorce you because our children, the products, our love, deserve a whole family, and the knowledge that they were not a mistake. Even though your actions signaled to them that I was a mistake, hence their creation as if on cue, a bright white sailboat, many times the size of a small boat pulled up to the dock. Sue waved, surrounded by her children. I forgot to tell you, Karen, but didn't ask. We're retired. Sue runs her own consulting firm now, and I'm consulting. Since you wouldn't wait for me to travel the world, I'll go with her and the kids, and we'll have a great time, paid for by the trust. But it's not revenge, either. It's just getting my life back after cheating. You want to know what's better than revenge? Richard took a deep breath. I forgive you, he said. I have no resentment or hatred or anger toward you. I just don't care. I forgave you, gave up on you, and shut down. Despite your best efforts to be what you thought you were, you've become irrelevant, and your ethics violations are your own problem. 
He stood up and walked toward the sunset, framed by water swollen from the summer rain. 